and today we're going to do a little bit of talking about uh, and a chat about within the world of Otto Gross uh, but we're going to be talking about the uh, nature of rebellion and also uh, of the shadow and maybe a little bit about how those two things are linked um, so maybe we can start by kind of defining what we think rebellion is and uh, where is rebellion say that again where is rebellion where is rebellion yeah what is what is rebellion i heard uh, where <laughs> okay where yeah so what is what is rebellion and it, it's a part of our <laughs> natures i think it's a part of all our natures to some extent and uh, I think it can have both positive and negative aspects to it. And certainly Gross was something of a rebellious character for most, what seems like most of what we know of his life. Um, yeah, from his childhood onwards. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't seem to outgrow some aspects of um, his childhood rebellion either. Yeah. I think that's an important point. Um, but I was thinking I might read a little bit. Oh, go. Sort of <laughs> I'm going to read a little bit from... Uh, I'm glad you're prepared. I found this book. Again. <laughs> um, this has got... What is me, the book? Yeah, I'll just show you so you can get the title. If, if you're interested, you can maybe buy a copy of this book from the lo a lovely uh, Gottfried Hewer. Um, is is a very is a good book and it's definitely worth a read. Yes, yeah. it's, it's interesting. So I was thinking I might read a bit about what other people thought of Gross's character. Ah, cool. You know okay. that I, I don't know if you can remember that long list, <laughs> um, but I'll read some of the terms, um, and these are kind of pejorative catch-all phrases that describe Gross from both people that knew him and people who've written about him and that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll just skim through and give some of the more juicy epithets um, ascribed to this man. Um, so we've got, um, it starts off quite pleasantly, a highly intelligent man, an elf king, um, Prometheus. That's who, quite. Who are these quotes? Who are the quotes from? I can read them out if you like. Yeah, just, just put their, their name by the quote. Okay, so a highly intelligent man. That's uh, Freud and Jung saying that. Right. Uh, cool. uh, some of them have got who's the, the author in brackets. So I'll read out who some of them are by, otherwise we'll be here all day on this. Um, uh, an elf king, that's Jaffe. Um, Prometheus, that's Kalisha in 1917. Um, the intellectual heir of the hotly debated Vienna psychoanalyst Freud. That's anonymous. Um, so beautiful, like a white Dionysus. Uh, that's D.H. Lawrence saying that. Um, sexual revolutionary. We've got rev revolutionary in there. Uh, that's that's a coup quote. That's a coup quote. From I'm talking. Twenty-two. I don't know if that's Sophie Coup. What year is it? 1922. That'll be Anton Kuhn, my great uncle. It'll be Anton. Anton, yeah. Um, vampire. Um, osh, osh. Uh, let's find some other. A Timothy Leary of his time. That's by HHH. I don't know who HHH is. But that's, a, to, that's an author. Is, Demon, sexual delinquent, uh, prophet of the new age, 
devil underneath the couch. Who, uh, who's that one? That's a nice quote. That is someone called Rolf. That's from 1993. So that we're moving into people who've written about him later on. A, promo a proponent of sexual libertarianism and drugs. Um, that's Holbrook in 1992. Um, a noted German drug pe peddler, <laughs> anarchist uh -huh. and criminal. Um, an inconvenient man. Um, I mean, I could go on. There's pages and pages of these. So he so there's, there's there's very kind of different kind of conflicting ideas about him or yeah yeah aspects. yeah. But there's a there's a draw there. There's a psychic draw towards uh, a revolutionary figure or a rebellious figure. Um, very, very much. Yeah, and Dionysus is mentioned there, and we can yeah. draw parallels with the with kind of fated, uh, maybe perhaps self destructive figures from our own culture. You know, like it, rock and roll figures and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I I, oft, I often in my mind I equate him to like a rock and roll star in his yeah behaviour and his self destructive nature. And it's kind of there, but for the grace of God, go I. It's like, well, we're attracted to that impulse. It's quite yeah. an extreme impulse, um, but wouldn't necessarily want to go there our, ourselves, you know. Oh, that. it's destructive, isn't it? And it's yeah. damaging and it's, stuff, it's, so, yeah. it's certainly, certainly in Gross's case, it was a destructive impulse. But I think there's a blending, a merge of a kind of, positive rebellious impulse yeah. and a, a negative aspect as well that get conflated within the character of gross so yeah and, and some of that's political it depends where the, where the person is on the spectrum of their politics or their personality well whether that's a good thing or a bad thing i don't know i would say any kind of political extreme whether that be a right wing or left wing or whatever you want to call it extreme has a, a self-destructive tendency about it um in the pursuit of an impossible goal yeah um, impossible is right yeah um, so th th there's often it, you see that within these movements there's a kind of purity spiraling spiraling is a this bit of a modern phrase so it, it in the pursuit of this, again, we just heard the word Promethean. Um, in pursuit of this Promethean goal, nothing is ever quite good enough. And uh, so you're this, 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 this is part of his attraction, isn't it? Is this kind of pure rebellion against the face of, of the practicality of it like what he's trying to change or rebelling against yeah it's kind of impossible in a way yeah and to be a bit Jungian about it um yeah. instead of addressing the these archetypes actually yeah. trying to actually just um letting the archetypes rule and you know mirroring the archetypes in this kind of well, God or devil-like way um, on a, on this sort of path to dis destruction because it can never be a, a, achieved in that sense. Um, but uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, I lost my train of thought there. But I'm let's sure. talk. Let's talk a little bit about what we might see as positive aspects of rebellion um, about his specifically or yeah, just in general yeah and his work and how that might have come out in his work as a kind of driver so oh, 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 ultimately he's trying to create a better world and um better, better individuals so the 
revolution starts from from within is his kind of motto so it's about working from yourself and um, starting a revolution in your own thoughts and your own um, subconscious um, so his, his rebellion is about trying to make things better it wasn't just for the sake of it yeah but and for himself I think and I think that's an aspect of all these um, well you might say it's an aspect of all people drawn into the realm of psychoanalysis be it as a um, analyst or a um, client or whatever um, yeah. that there's some driver or trauma or, or, or whatever that's enough of an engine to drive change in the individual um, and um, drive change try to improve yourself try to understand yeah. yourself yeah um, yeah uh, and we've, we've also said it's a little bit difficult in that a lot of his drive came from his childhood and his rebellion from his dad being such you know, an authoritative figure um, and him being so intelligent and stuff um, but later when he had his mutual analysis with Jung, with Jung Young said also had insights, but quickly forgot them within the same session. So like he got insights into himself and then quickly went somewhere else and, and made no progress. In, in a kind own. of mania. Yeah. 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 So. But the principle of mutual analysis itself is quite a positive rebellion within within a rebellion within psychoanalysis so, yeah. so it, it is a, a breaking down of the hierarchy of the session of a kind of uh, what you know authority yeah. figure and a kind of devoted listening patient uh, okay, that's, the, that's definitely part of Otto's um, influence and part of his rebellion to it. So Freud's obviously known for the casting for the uh, couch. Um, Freud is the casting couch. I nearly said the ca <laughs> casting couch. It depends on the side of the list, <laughs> but um, whereas, whereas Otto was more about breaking down that structure between patient and um, doctor. Yeah. Which was, it, it, I think, you could argue was very beneficial to psychoanalysis as it, as it moved forward, you know. Um, interestingly, he, he's sort of like a, he's an antagonist against the idea of transference, but there's something leveling in that mutual analysis which kind of he's some element of that is on we can talk we are going to talk about transference later but he he kind of leveling the playing field there you know um but it's leveling, leveling the play, play field was also getting used to well we'll get back to this anyway we'll yeah on a we'll get yeah. back to that um but i i was thinking let's keep talking about sort of positive rebellion. So there's like a natural, um, I suppose you alluded to it earlier where we were talking about a kind of natural step away from the parental figures out into the world and a kind of creation of one's own space. Yeah. And a space for idea, one's own ideas, one, one's own thought. And I mean, he's, he, he, yeah, okay, he went to extremes, but he definitely was striving to go, right, I'm going to make my mark on this and I'm going to come up with my own uh, takes and my own fresh ideas, um, which is, a, um, I think, I think that's, you could describe that as a positive impulse, you know. 
it's a positive impulse also uh, like a positive influence if if you don't have people like him rebelling and pushing himself out there then how's the change going to happen so yeah. there has to be someone to lead the way a little bit yeah and he's representing a kind of useful engine for change within the field um so like the next wave um the next so wave. It's, so it's not necessarily a static system. It's like, well, we've got we've, Freud's opened the door on the unconscious and and we're going to build on that and make new steps and spread further out and, and uh, explore this further. Um, and, uh, yeah, he's, and in that sense, he's, he's starting to be the, you know, kind of grown up son you know um and at, at, at one stage yes but there's a fight there and a kind of rebellious fight no i'm gonna he needs to protect his ideas as much as freud is kind of protecting his ideas or psychoanalysis as a whole um and there's a whole kind of generation of of uh, psychoanalytical thinkers who get booted out and they're the kind yeah. of rebels who were once yeah. in the fold and they go off to do their own things. Uh, Wilhelm Reich comes to mind, Otto Rank uh, also, um, and there are many e even others. even Carl, even Carl Jung. Yeah, and Jung. Yeah, extent, yeah. absolutely Jung. Yeah, yeah. Um, and. That I guess what I'm trying to get at is the it's the creation of this kind of rebellious space where they're not just dominated by uh, the previous thought um, might be influenced and might be standing on the shoulders of that thought, but they're yeah, well, every, 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 everyone's standing on someone else's shoulder, like nothing comes from nowhere, but. Also, was very pure, I think, in what he was doing, and he he didn't protect his work and his ideas. Um, he was he was too busy being rebellious. And yeah. Well, he's he's also he's got this political aspect as well. So, yeah. which is you know he's in, into ideas of mutualism and anarchism, and there's a kind of um, extreme openness. Um, to those movements, and he he was certainly, I, I've said this before, he was trying. There was some cross pollination between his thoughts about uh, um, the psyche and his thoughts about the political world. Um, I mean, I think Gottfried Hewitt, um even suggests that he might have coined or express the idea that the personal is political um yeah. and you know that's a, there's a kind of reiteration of other thought before it but it's a nice um tangible phrase i suppose um, it, it's the nice it's the nice nice phrase that's only just starting to be more accepted in the field now a hundred years later yeah yeah um, um, but yes, he, he he had he had positive rebellion in lots of areas. So whether it's anarchy, um, se sexual revolution, you could call it, or just relationships. Yeah, um, it's a positive influence you can find in all those areas. Yeah, uh, well, let's talk yeah. about let's talk about the sort of sexual revolutionary aspect, um, okay. because there's a feeling that I mean Freud talks a lot about kind of um, instinctive drives and uh, drives that basic your basic drives that need to be met to some extent oh. needs needs oh. needs or drives. And, um, and 
gross is coming in and going, I mean, obviously there's disagreement about what those things are. Um, yeah. And there continues to be disagreement about what those things are. Um, but gross comes in like a sort of battering ram going, almost like there isn't, an, isn't enough sex, you know. I mean, the, the, the hand grenade that's always, yeah. the hand grenade that's always chucked at Freud is, right, oh, he's yeah. obsessed with sex, you know. And not, not to my reading of him, you know. Um, and then Gross comes in going, no, more sex, you know. Like, you haven't put enough emphasis on it or explored it enough. And he, he has... No, I, 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 I disagree slightly. So I think both, both Otto and... Young diverged and decided, like with Freud, everything has a sexual component. And they both disagreed with him and said, well, it might be the case a lot of the time, but not all the time. But also, when it, get, when it came to the sexual stuff, it was a lot more for, for unrepressing everything. Yeah. Completely. I think, and making it, making stuff acceptable. I think there's a, uh, yeah. Um, this, there can be some confusion between a kind of what's like libid and a libidinal force, a libidinal sure. energy, and a kind yeah. of and sexual activity. There's some yeah. uh, that those things can become conflated um, when people are criticising things. Um, but he, yeah, I mean. And there's also, there's a sense that people are trying to get what a kind of natural sexual expression might look like, or a kind of deeper sexual expression um, that... But I, th I think just in the, in the most kind of obvious basic sense, in terms of relationships, we're always asking ourselves, is the, like, the societal norm of, you get married, you have children. Is that is that normal? You know, is monogamy normal? Yeah. I mean, that's quite a common question that we ask ourselves. Yeah. And um, with also the answer was no. Yeah, but then he it does seem like a disaster area at the same time. <laughs> I mean, f from my perspective, it just seems like a see. I mean, I'm being critical of him now. And yeah, it's, I've always concentrated on the positives. <laughs> well, we can tip over. <laughs> uh, oh, be critical, God. Well, I, it, yeah, I think it needed to be said. Um, you, you know, you've got like you're saying it's they've been through a kind of uh, culturally they've been through a repressive age. At the time, they've been in in a kind of I suppose a, quite a repressive cultural period um, but the, the context is everything isn't it so it's not yeah. now this is over 100 years ago yeah things, well, things well, are very things, different things but things um could, could uh, what's the word i'm looking for like you have an idea of sex that's very performative and structured and um um, maybe from a religious aspect, just for reproduction, uh, oh. pleasures thrown out the window. Um, you know, I mean, that's a, a, a kind of very Puritan end of things. But, um, but also, like, so a lot of it would be like the pleasures for the man and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So the women just do what they're told, and they look after children. Yeah, they have sex when the men want wants our sex and the pleasures for the guy really yeah and Otto is against all of that so and we, his rebellion and we, and we can see some um going coming going back to a scona yeah we can see some exploration of that there um and sort of <laughs> comp, comp, you know experimental <laughs> sexual mores like uh, free love or what what have you you know um, but he 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 offered his wife to other people in vienna 
and in uh, Munich and places. But, yeah, that was good of him, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Did she get a yeah. say? <laughs> Did she get a, I mean... I, d I, I, would, I would have thought so. I think she, she had a... She ended up having a relationship with one of the anarchists. Um, I don't know if it's Musham or his friend. Right. Who was meant to be gay or bisexual or something. Right. But they, they ended up having a child together and stuff. But that, that was also getting them together. So it's a very kind of unusual... Um, yeah, there's a little bit of... I've got this formula. Do you want to... I'm definitely right about it. Yeah. Um, it's a bit prescriptive. Um, itself, you know. Um, like we should definitely... You can see it in revolutionary says We should all definitely be doing this. And then someone goes... Yeah, but I don't like. To. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm a bit scared. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a bit like what I was saying earlier. All these extreme politicals that that kind of can get quite tyrannical if you're not doing the list of things straight away. You know. Um, sure. You don't belong. Yeah. Well, have we all got consensus? And an ever smaller group. You know, it's like the rebel. I mean, this is one of the problems with a kind of extreme rebellion. The group will get smaller and smaller <laughs> and quite isolating. And it, I, I often think that that happened in Gross's life too. It's in quite a tragic way that he, he got more and more isolated and kind of until it was just him. Just him. Him yeah. and Fran Jung. Yeah, but I, I, I think this is what happens quite naturally. People grow up and have different needs. You know, you have different requirements. Yeah. You know, and if you have children like he did, at least the the mothers had to take responsibility. So they had to find something a bit more sensible than just being rebellious. Yeah. Know? So. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I... I just see him, you know, he had quite an ignominious death. He's there. Yeah. And his friends are deserting him. No, he's not only is he rejected by the psychoanalytical establishment, and he's doing this thing where he's, he's taking political ideas and exchanging, and he's trying to write things in anarchistic journals at the same time. And even they... <laughs> they end up rejecting him as well. It's like, you know, um, he, 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 and this, you know, this flags up kind of some of the negative aspects of rebellion, you know, especially in such an extreme form, form as grosses. Um, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about having a creative space for in for innovation yeah. uh, and and going out on your own and giving that some breathing space and that's a positive aspect but there's also a kind of what point is your revolution if you're on your own in a basement with no friends you know yeah and his, his, his revolution seems to be mainly spending time with people and talking so you know, go for, to Munich and chat to the artists or the writers and then to Berlin and then to Vienna. So it's like, where, where's the, even in his rebellion, where's the plan or the structure beyond wandering around chatting? Yeah. You know, so it seems just a little bit wild and out there. It's like he's, he wants to do everything, but what's he actually, what's he actually doing, man? Like, it's, it's tempting to imagine his character and whether he was a kind of manic, overbearing, <laughs> smelly. Um, yeah. I mean, well, you know, probably, yeah, we probably loved him for a day and then you thought he's tank and it was a bit annoying. It, how much of it can you take? Yeah. And uh, there's, 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 there's some good quotes from his ex wife and her sister who also dated him, I can't remember which one it is, said something, 
like he needs he needs people to follow him you know like a messiah and yeah. if you don't if you're not 100 percent with him then you're against him yeah you know, so it must have been it must have been tough yeah having a relationship with him yeah i i'm reminded i was talking to a friend the other day about um Uh, we could talk a little bit about character types, actually, and this might open it up a bit. Um, I was reminded, I was talking to a friend, and we were talking about people who, who are into certain drugs or whatever, like, a, for example, like a speed freak. Yeah. And my ex generally, in my experience of speed freaks, is when they top, stop taking the speed, yeah. they're still going at... Uh, 100 miles an hour and you think well why did you need that in the first place but it's kind of like the character matches the drug that they end up taking just it's just yeah. the same <laughs> you know um to, that, to an extent to an extent but then you can also say the drugs are still kind of having an effect afterwards yeah as well. so there's a bit well, of that this might bring in some shadow aspects now we could maybe talk about this and i was before this program shadow. I, yeah i was thinking well i don't actually know when uh young started talking about the concept of the shadow i don't know whether that predates i i don't know when you know i'm it would have been it would have been after um also, his relationship with Otto. Yeah. Um, I don't know when. I don't know if you've yeah. looked it up since. Yeah, young wrote for a long time. I haven't read yeah. all his work. Um, uh, if you're a, we should say, if you're, uh, if you've read a lot of young and you're an expert and everything, please. You know a lot more than we do. Yeah. Tell us when he came up with the, the concept of the shadow. And let's try and describe what we mean by the shadow and that's a kind of Jung's version of um, the unconscious depths shall we say and archetypes within that um, which are the dark maybe characterized as the darker aspects of the unconscious yeah. um, which if not addressed may I mean may uh, have negative uh, consequences in a person's life. I hope that makes sense. Um, um, but uh, so these, it might be like a figure that appears in a dream, um, like a, a sort of trickster character or something like that, like a devil or some character that has a kind of dark aspect. Uh, and they may embody some truth about uh, that person's um, psychic content and maybe would be a, a signpost to things that need to be addressed consciously in a person's life. Um, and people have made this uh, assertion that um gross represents a kind of shadow figure in jung's life yeah um, because he's like a wild crazy man <laughs> um and he's exp and he's actively in his life exploring things that may be a signpost to jung that he's not addressing in in that Jung's not addressing in his own character. Uh, yeah. Darker. I, lo I, I love that sort of stuff. So you have like the expert of looking within that hasn't really looked within himself as much as he could have. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's it, it, a oh, never ending process, you know. It's never ending process. Um, to me, it seems like there's two aspects to the shadow 
type of young that, that comes from Otto Groves. One, you've got the work aspect, and then you've got his relationship with women as well. So there seems to be a bit of both came out of their relationship. Yeah. Yeah, there's a... It's... Um, having this analysis with uh, Gross, Young analysing Gross, or mutual analysis, um, and just him knowing him, um, and seeing what kind of life he leads that that's gonna that's yeah, Jung's gonna see aspects of that and go well hang on why is this a challenge to me why do I why am I interested in this guy um why am I not like this guy um and these might be to some degree messages from Jung's own unconscious in a kind of synchronistic sense, uh, that there's some tension there and that there's something internally that Jung uh, needs to address. And that might be a, a more natural expression of his sexuality. Yeah. So it's like, kind of like having the devil in your ear a little bit. Um, I guess at the beginning, um, so Jung had some sort of feelings for his patient, didn't he? Um, no one. But the interesting thing is they're talking about repression and unrepressing and stuff. And then obviously Jung's got his repressing his feelings or his sexual thoughts for this, yeah. this girl. And then it's very enticing if you've got both saying to him, you're repressing yourself, stop repressing yourself. If you want to do something, do it. Like, it's just society stopping you and ideas. It's not anything concrete or real. Yeah, and... I mean, there's a lot in there. There's a kind of, well, where are the rules coming from? Where are the rules, man? There's no yeah. rules. And, no and, minds, anyway. and is it a kind of societal thing? Um, are our society's rules an expression of un a collective expression of unresolved aspects of the shadow in people's personality mm. um you know that's a very yeah. that, you know you'll be, you, be going back a thousand thousands of years to, to get into that really um yeah i think that's something they were all interested in as well because it's like um, if you look at the kind of Ascona culture again, um, they are, and if you think even about the idea of um, addressing the the subconscious thoughts, because and um, we're talking pre pre like I mean, however far you want to go back, but kind of pre the sort of repressive nature of the Enlightenment era. I mean, never a more appallingly named. <laughs> I mean, from my perspective, it should be the enheaviment or whatever. You know, um, in darkens. In darkens. Yeah, um, but. If you're talking about kind of living synchronistically or allowing actually allowing some dialogue with the unconscious people would have done that in their uh, and this is kind of why we'll go off on a tangent here but this is kind of why one of the reasons i think jung was interested in mythology and paganism mm -hmm. and that sort of thing it would have been a natural thing for people to go oh right uh there's some crows there that, that that's a message for me that I need to do something uh, I need to look within um, you know um, there's this sort of synchronistic happening and there's this kind of synchronistic happening with Jung's meeting and dialogue with gross 
Yeah, I think even he said himself that it kind of reflected something in himself, pulled something of himself out. Uh, but it's, it seems to me like he struggled with it and that, and didn't really admit much about it afterwards. Well, let's talk about the vice versa. I mean, yeah, is it an accident that Gross is there with Young? Has Young got something to teach Gross, and that that he's not doing? You know, and and I I don't know. I was thinking I was thinking about their names actually. Okay. This morning, I was thinking, and I'm sure this both occurred to them and has occurred. Right, we're recording, I think. Yeah. We're back. Uh, not for Wait. you. There'll just be a weird edit now. Uh, but uh, we had some technical issues and Corinne switched devices. I think I was in the middle of dribbling on about what was I going on about? I can't remember. Um, names, names. Oh yeah, it just struck me, struck me this morning that there's uh, kind of um, if you translate their names, gross is this gross character. Young means young, and I kind of have this picture of uh, what young as a like a swatty school. Uh, for some reason <laughs> and um gross is this kind of larger than life um character e kind of introvert and extrovert which is is um quite interesting um well Gro gross has we've got two meanings for gross haven't we? so we've got english and the german so the german is big yeah 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 so there's the uh, the english word as well yeah um but uh and then i thought isn't that nominative determinism and i looked it up and and lo and behold who comes up with nominative determinism Carl Young. Young? <laughs> um uh, that's quite interesting. That, that's just a little aside. It's a little aside. We could go on pages about that. My my mum was a school teacher, and she said she'd know the personality of all the kids by their names pretty quickly. And especially anyone beginning with J was normally naughty. Yeah. Jack, Jade, you know. And yeah, and where does that all come from? And um yeah i mean i'd like to explore what young said about that um maybe let's try and read about that um and where what he thinks the source of that determinism is um would be quite interesting again if you know about that get in touch with us please um so uh yeah and that happens to be one of the things the sort of definition of introversion and extroversion and we must be clear that we're talking about these in terms of the kind of pathologies not in the natural in the sort of colloquial sense where people go oh he's an extrovert he's an introvert but we're talking about it in ter in uh, in psychological terms as a as a pathology in a kind of extreme um which I suppose rebellion can embody to a degree, both perhaps in an extrovert way or in an introvert way. Um, but there's certainly this, there's a kind of dodging um, the shadow aspects of the psyche in writing everything large upon the world. And um, so all the problems are out there. And, we see that in quite strongly in different political movements, um, uh, of, and obviously Gross was drawn to that. Um, um, I've lost my train of thought. No, <laughs> I can always dribble on, mate. Yeah, there's no kids screaming in a bar. Um 
So what what about the 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 young shadow? Like we haven't really gone into that too much. Do uh, you mean are we are we talking? Are you talking in terms of Jung as a representation of Otto's shadow? Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And like I think, like you said earlier, it, he had an instinct. Gross had an instinct for these things. He was a clever guy, and he had an instinct for the psychological. But he would get distracted, and I think certainly things would go unaddressed so we're really talking about what the seat of the of that rebellion is and is it it is is the fight in the world or is there an internal battle that needs to take place with with uh, these darker aspects um that might resolve that battle in the world to some extent. Um, mm. And I think that's really the, the crux of this, you know. Um, like, and again, we can use politics as an example. Um, we see a, you see a lot of people running around the streets, raging and going, ah, it's those people's fault. <laughs> it's those people's fault. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, all these see all these problems in the world, and there's a loudness to that, and there's a um, a kind of external rage, yeah, which I, think, which, which I think is really a message from the psyche and the unconscious. Um, I know for, for sure. I know. For, I think currently there's a lot of that. There's a lot of rage, a lot of external rage. But I, I always wonder how much people look within themselves and uh, what, what they're trying to work out about themselves rather yeah. than just shouting and complaining. Yeah. Um, with, with Otto Gross, it, a lot of it seems quite obvious, like coming back from his family and stuff. And uh, you talk about obvious things from Freud, like a, lo a lack of love in your childhood. And then expectations of his parents, the way he was treated, and what they wanted from him. Or, or what form that love, that expression of love, if there is any, yeah. uh, palpable to the child, takes. And whether that, you know, um, I mean, we can make leaps, I mean, we can make speculative leaps in it, because we don't really have that much information, but we could sort of say, you know, um, his, what I can say is there's some dark aspects in his in his childhood, and and that are unaddressed, you know, and and it's caused causing this kind of arrested adolescent in the world arrested development yeah yeah well it's very common with i mean we're c kind of in a very infantilized society at the moment um and uh you know well, I, think, I think i think with both as well we can also say like we are speculating a little bit and, and we're just kind of joining very obvious thoughts but he would have been praised from his dad and his mum for being intelligent and trying to achieve stuff. So even though he's rebellion, he's also trying to find acceptance and love for him. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right. And he, he does kind of, as we said in the last video, start to follow his father's path in some way. So he starts down a kind of conformist path maybe looking for love and uh, recognition that way uh, yeah. and um, but it there's something mechanical and uh, and you see this in 
in the Ascona movement, again, you see this rejection of a, a world that is uh, materialistic, uh, mechanical, hyper-rational. Um, so there's kind of signposts there, and it's almost like Gross doesn't see the signposts. He's just reactive. Um, like a, but like has a, occasional yeah. in, insights that are brilliant. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's quite amazing when someone's work is all about the internal and the subconscious and not really developing it within themselves. Yeah. Um, th this is why I'm interested in kind of in the history. I'm kind of a bit interested in the history of when it's like, had, had Jung got there yet enough to help Otto at that point? Could Otto really be helped unless he wanted to help himself? Um, uh, but also, it's kind of, I'll also stress that it's kind of, on some level, it's not important because they are who they are. And the, even before you make terms for these things, the psyche is operating in that way. Yeah. Um, so it, the association between them is already there and it's already potent. Um, so before things are even named or uh, defined, before terms are even named or defined. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. It's 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 very difficult to know a lot of stuff about you know going back in time and being there. Uh, yeah, this kind of, is the thing. I wonder how far along they were, and um, and whether they, how much chance they had of helping helping each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's seen. It kind of reads like Rose had a very small window of where he was considered really brilliant and could have achieved something, and then it kind of went. Yeah. Um, so when, when exactly he could have really been helped, it's hard to know. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's, really, it's still a nascent uh, movement. I mean, I mean, people were barely even buying. It took a long time for even Freud's ideas to disseminate. I mean, this was rare. This was a rare thing. Um, you know, people it, people took a long time to catch on to this stuff. Um, well, even, even it took a long time to... So you talk about Reich. He's considered to be the, like, the event of the sexual revo revolution in America and stuff. But his ideas are supposed to come from Otto Gross. Right. And, and that's 20 years earlier, so... What, what the world I didn't know that. Really I didn't know that people had made that association between them, but I can see yeah, threads. Apparently, there. apparently, because Reich, Reich would have known a lot of people that knew Otto. Uh, but it was actually Fran, Fran Jung who was Otto Otto Gross's closest friend. Right. He made the association, and he said he's he basically just plagiarized him, went to America and told people all this stuff, and it was it was mainly Otto's concepts. But the world wouldn't have been ready for them concepts 20 years earlier, 25 years earlier, anyway. It wasn't ready in Reich's time, either. <laughs> no, right, probably um, still not ready, either. No. But, um, they utterly destroyed him. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Reich's uh, books were burnt, um, you know. Um, by who? By the authorities in America. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and he, he languished in prison as well. You know, I mean, it really, yeah, people didn't like him. Uh, the but powers that be did, didn't like him. But he did invent the orgasmatron. Yeah. I think, I mean, I don't know what to make of all that, uh, but other than there's the mind of an innovator there. Um, and in that way, 
when we're talking about rebellion, there is a positive rebellious space, I would say. Yeah. Such a thing. Yeah. Well, I think, like, in just in general, everyday terms, I always try and look at two sides to things, and there's nearly always positive and negative, there's always some truth in, in between. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. In, I mean, we're jumping around a little bit here, but we've yeah. sort of been interrupted and the flow's got all over the place. Um, let's talk about that in, in terms of the shadow. Uh, yeah. let, uh, like one of the one of the archetypes that um, Jung talks about is the the trickster ar archetype who will appear. Let's say it's in a dream, but it could be in a drawing, could be in a dialogue, could even be in a dialogue with somebody you meet. Um, and the first instinct being that you distrust this character, they're wicked and they're evil and they represent things that you think you perhaps are not. Uh, but then through a dialogue with the character, you might discover that they have some knowledge about yourself and that they are perhaps to be trusted. Um, mm. And it, that, I think that could describe, because that dialogue didn't seem to really happen, that can perhaps describe Jung and Gross's relationship to a degree. Um, yeah, well it's, it's, from what I've read, so when they first met each other, like 1904 to 1908, Jung had a lot of good things to say about Gross. But then over the years, it's all negative stuff. Um, so then you've got to wonder how much of that is something internal to him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is, it, is he creating a natural, what might be quite a natural barrier for his own, to make a space for his own work? Um, or is he shutting out things that he himself needs to address? And, and we know that later on, uh, Jung experienced a, a breakdown of some kind, you know. Um, yeah, uh, but I, I think not, Jung, these people Jung are not immune. Jung quite a lot of times, didn't yeah. he? These, so. people, these people are not immune from a, a psychic breakdown or change? Um, I'd, I'd say they're probably more likely on the spectrum just because they're working in that field and, and playing we, with ideas and stuff. And, and we were talking about perhaps the uh, uh, when we started, we were talking about what drives someone to want to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. So they have an inherent need from somewhere already. Yeah, and is that some? Is that a shadow aspect? that needs to be expressed as well. Yeah. Uh, I think we could probably <laughs> leave it there. Um, I mean, we've oh. talked about all sorts of things. I, I, I just, I'll just say one last thing on, on that is, then Cole, Cole Young went on to have lots of affairs and treated women badly and treated his wife badly. Really? I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, so he, he, he had like, I think Tony Wolf. But he, had, he was a patient as well. But he, he'd have women come to his marital home and have affairs with him. Right. So he but this does, is at, this is, he, but this does. is at the same time he's slagging off Otto <laughs> Gross for going to Ascona. Right. And saying he's a delinquent and all this other stuff. So it's like, I'm wondering how much of this is some sort of psychological uh, game going on within himself. Right that aspect of stuff as well. But you it's know? interesting that you say he did uh, explore Gross's world to some extent in real life, in active life. I mean, hard to find the terms. We're talking about the unconscious, but I mean, these, these things are intrinsic. Well, I, I definitely think he influenced him in terms of him having affairs and stuff like that. So... You know, he's, he's obviously made some sort of decision at some point or something connected 
And so all of them really were quite, um, they treated women badly, even though they were self-proclaimed feminists and stuff like that. Right. Um, they all treated women badly, Freud as well, Otto as well. Um, so then you wonder if there's a bit of a contradiction between what they're saying and what they're doing, and then also what, Young saying about growth and then what he's, what he's doing in his own relationships with women. Right. So he's having all these affairs and treating them badly and stuff. And then at the same time, he's putting someone else down for living a free, free love lifestyle. Right. Which, is, which was completely honest and open. Yeah. It wasn't hidden. So I, th I think there's a lot of shadow work going on there, Young. Yeah, I think. Um... I think it can often be a a, a bit of a like a I, I talked about synchronicity earlier, like a synchronistic um, signpost. If you find yourself heavily criticising someone for their behaviour um, yeah. and and absorbed in in someone else's life to that degree and you're sort of going oh that person <laughs> you know there's something going there's on something, otherwise it'd, it'd be in difference wouldn't it it'd just be yeah. it wouldn't be much so why would you care what they're up to why would you care yeah just some um, some ideas from the past man like that's it the same thing like why would you need a radical political movement no you wouldn't don't need it don't need it man yeah we need the sunshine. Yeah. Um, so that was great, man. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, and we'll try and do another one again soon, folks. Yeah, we'll try and make it a bit sooner. Um, we'll come back. Yeah. And maybe we'll, we'll do, the, do a review on the film. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. That's a nice, easy one. There's lots to dive into there, yeah. And, and can be fun, it might be fun as well, so Do we, check that out. you want to say anything else? Oh, please, this is what YouTube people do. Click all the buttons. <laughs> um, um, thumbs, thumbs up. Yeah, all of those things. The thing is, we're too English. So, like, if you're American, you have, like, effects going on. And, like, oh, there would be, a, like, a big train would come in. <laughs> like, imagine like, that. Sub like, subscribe, share. Yeah. Imagine that animation now. Yeah. Um, um, imagine more American and we'll be loud. All that stuff. That's great. All right. All right. Cheers, guys. Uh, Thank we'll you for... We'll be back soon. And we will appreciate any comments. Absolutely. Um, and corrections as well. Please comment. And if you're interested in this subject or you think other people will would be interested in this topic, uh, yeah. send them a link to the video. And I hope you're all okay in this uh, weird period. Yes. Take care of yourselves. Right. Cheers, bro. Bye for now. Bye for now.